be in yet. We'll just look at it though. So it's in the classwork tab um, under induction and it's uh, called the induction checklist. Okay, so we've got a file upload as well for it. Um, so you've got a few options with this. If you just open it, click on it, um, and then you get the option to open with. So um, if you don't get the download appearing right here, then you can just open it with Zip Extractor or you can open it straight into Google Docs. Um, your other option, you can open in a new window and just let that appear. Then you've got the option to download it. Okay, so if you want to download it and edit it in Microsoft Word, that's one way that you can do it. If you've got Microsoft Word on your machine, and then you can just literally click on the boxes. Uh, your other option, just open it in Google Docs. Then when it appears in Google Docs, um, you can just basically put in like a cross here. So where um, Google Classroom initial training, and just backspace that out and put in a cross. Uh, you don't have to go faff around with um, inserting symbols, the little uh, tick boxes or anything like that. So you can just simply backspace and put crosses in. Okay, so oh, then, that's great. Jim. Yeah. I, I, I knew I could do that, but I thought I'd have it in the box. But no, that's <laughs> no thank you very much. No problem. Has anybody else got any questions about this? So um, basically, we upload it um, once we've finished after week four, um, and then that's just the last of the information. Okay, so all of the information is in the induction section. Um, and so we'll just pop that to the classroom, close that down. So in our induction section, um, we've got the induction PowerPoint, we've got that checklist and then the file upload. If you're going along the route of using Google Docs, you can just simply share it with me and then I can pick it up that way. Okay. Right, so that was that um, thing that we had to raise. Anything else that uh, you think of, then please flag up. So um, next thing, we'll just jump in and have a look at the work you completed. So how did you get on with the project I left you with last week? And that was, you remember, the moon and the landscape and opening as layers. Um, how did how did you get on with that? Was that okay or not? It was okay, I think. Yes, yeah, it was pretty straightforward. Okay. Yeah. Um, so working in that way, so we're starting this integration between Lightroom and Photoshop, working between the two. What did you notice after you'd completed the Photoshop work and you went to File and Save or Command or Control and S? What did you notice about the file? Maybe you didn't notice anything. <laughs> yeah, you, it, it ends up in Lightroom and you get an extra file. Yeah, what sort of file is it when it ends up in Lightroom? Um, was it, was it a TIFF? Just possibly a TIFF file. Yeah, it's a TIFF. So that's just something to remember. You don't have to do anything else but just save the file once you've opened it as layers in Photoshop. Then it takes itself back into Lightroom but then you've got like your two originals you started with and then you've got the composite which is a TIFF file. So what do we know about the TIFF file? Does anybody know anything? What does it stand for? TIFF file. It has all no the idea. I was just going to ask you that too. Oh, sorry, Jonathan's going to, to say something. It's got all the data you can process it uh, easily. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what it stands for. Well, it stands for tagged image file format. Um, and basically, right, it has got all the, the data in it. So, um, and it's a very good file format if you've got an image that's particularly good. Um, and so it's saving all of that data in it. 
It will be quite large, but not necessarily as large as a PSD file, a Photoshop file. So for really good quality work, if, say, for example, you know, you've taken an image, it's really good, you've processed it, you'd probably save a copy as a TIFF for best quality. And then you could also save another copy as a JPEG if you wanted to share it. So um, for, you know, really good images, TIFF is, is certainly worth considering. Okay. Right, so we'll get on now and see what we're going to do this evening. Oh, welcome, Graham. Sorry, I just saw that you popped in there late. Hi, Jim. Hi. So we're going to have, um, this is what our overview is for this evening. Um, so we'll get back to our critique and work. So as always, developmental in terms of critique. So it's always meant, you know, in the processor in the, the sort of way of continuous development. So uh, that's what we're looking at. And, you know, sort of good and bad together is really the way to go because that's a way to improve. And um, we'll do a quick uh, tip looking at virtual copies and snapshots. Um, so this is just when we, say, have an image file <coughs> and we, we would like to see it. <clears throat> excuse me, in different ways. So perhaps you've got a um, really nice image and you want to see what it would look like in black and white. You want to see what it would look like in cool with cool tones. Maybe you want to see what it would look like with warm tones before you decide on the processing, which route you're going to take. So um, we can do that using virtual copies, which I'm sure some of you know, um, and we can also do it in snapshots. So again, it's how this all integrates between Lightroom, Photoshop, and Adobe Camera Raw. So we're just going to take a little look at that, um, and because that's something you might want to incorporate into your workflow, okay? Um, we're going to be looking at isolating a subject, so um, a requested topic, cutouts, how we can cut out accurately, um, and so it's always good to practice working with cutouts, so we're going to do that. Changing backgrounds is another um, thing that we, we need to do when it comes to backgrounds and cutouts. Um, and presenting subjects on a clean background, um, because that can really make or break an image. And then we'll look at a project, which is a fun project, but again, um, developing Photoshop skills, a surfer in a teacup. So lots of interesting techniques for you to um, think about this evening. And we'll get going without further ado. But again, you know, don't forget, you can always contact me if there's something in particular that you would like covered or something you're struggling with or something you don't understand. And so if it's at the right level, I'm happy to cover it during one of our sessions. Right, so we'll jump into the critique. So um, Doug can't be here this evening. Doug's on holiday. Um, so we'll just make a little note of what everybody thinks about um, Doug's work. So this was a task that I left you with, um, and it was processing an image your version. So we were looking at the basic edits with the Fox image, and then I asked you to take a look at one of your own images and then develop that further and carry out the processing to enhance that image. So, um, first up we have Doug. I'll ask Graham, would you care to critique Doug's image? We've got before on the left and after on the right. Yeah, sure. I mean, it looks like he sort of cropped it in a, in a bit um, and uh, he's, he sort of made some adjustments to bring out the blue background so it's sort of um, standing out a bit. I mean, it, it, I don't know what exactly it is. It looks like it's sort of a, a board with some paint splashed across it, I think. But uh, either that or he's got some big birds flying around. And it's birds, <laughs> uh, one or the other. But uh, um, it, 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 certainly, it certainly contrasts the colours a, a, a lot better. Um, I, I think, I mean, I think I might have cro cropped it a little bit more because it's got a, like a sort of a bit of a mountain range thing going on at the bottom probably would have cropped that up a little bit myself but but in terms of bringing the colors out he's doing a really good job yeah mm, yeah okay so yeah um, it's funny how we all see something different i was seeing uh, the reflection of a church in a puddle 
Um, but there again, it's probably something entirely different. So church and steeple and uh, a lamppost. So, <laughs> and yeah, I think everybody's going to see something very different in this image. But I agree, he certainly enhanced the colour. So thank you for that, Gray. Um, next up, we have Heather. Uh, Jonathan, could you say something about Heather's before and after, please? Yeah, it's a big improvement. There's, there's more contrast, more clarity. Uh, sky's been brought out. Uh, it's just a lot, lot better after processing than from before. Yeah. Uh, the contrast in the hedges, you can see the detail in the border behind the statue in the lake. No, it's, it's greatly improved. Yeah, and it's really nice seeing that reflection in the water, isn't it, from with the sky. Um, yes. Shadows have been opened out really well. But the important thing is, I think, you know, that we're always aware we don't go too far to overcook images and that, you know, there comes that point where you have to pull back and just sort of make sure you're not making a mess and that you're actually happy with your edits. And you've done that beautifully here. Heather, anything to say? Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I was just, um, I couldn't quite bring out a bit more of the sky, but strangely the reflection of the sky seemed to be quite easy to bring out. So the reflection actually looks better than the sky for some reason. So what were you trying to do to bring out the sky? Just to bring out a little bit more of the blue and the cloud formation, a little bit more um, clarity of it. But What sort of yeah, techniques did you try? <laughs> Sorry? What sort of techniques did you try to bring out the well, sky? Well, that was just when I was adjusting the whole picture as one. I guess I could have set, isolated it and, and worked on it that way, but I, I didn't. Um, but yeah, I just thought it was a bit odd that the blues came out a bit more in the reflection and not so much in the sky. Yeah, so, you know, where you've got that type of um, thing going on, that would be a good case for using a graduated filter. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, and, you know, just yeah. pulling that down and then, because I'm sure there's a more of a sky in there, we can see in your process version, you know, that mm. the because obviously the sky is very bright and takes a little bit more work than the land to recover that detail. So using your graduated filter and, you know, pulling your highlights back quite a bit and mm. you'd probably find you could get some something else out of that sky. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, you've... I've forgotten about that. It's amazing how quickly you forget. Well, yeah, and if you've not been doing this stuff, and so that's why we're doing a little bit of revision of these techniques just so that, you know, it becomes like part of your workflow and, you know, you kind of zone in on those areas that need a bit of attention. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the rest of it's beautifully done. It's got some nice lighting on the statue as well, so all good. Well done. Is that something that you would do um, quite regularly take the highlights down in the shadows and then work on the whites and the blacks yes that's that's the basic workflow so working Standard. on that yeah working on those tonal adjustments to okay. just you know get everything the way it should be check the black points set correctly the white mm. points set correctly um, and you know just bringing those highlights down and the shadows up which at one time you know it used to be that the highlights went right down to minus 100 and the shadows went right up to plus 100 and that was the starting point and that does work quite well but once you've got a little bit more practice with this, as we saw with the fox, you're sort of yeah. looking at the highlight detail, the brightest bits, and you can actually recover more detail if you don't go right down to minus 100, but just sort of see the effect as you slowly take that slider to the left. And then you're looking for the dark bits like we did, um, looking for um, the dark rims around the eyes or the nose, and then just pulling the shadows up, 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 but not necessarily all the way to plus 100. So it's a little bit more sophisticated, if you like. Now you've got a bit more practice. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Emma. Um, James, could you critique this one, please? Yes, um, it's certainly brought the colours out, especially in the background, the the, the sandy brown colours have certainly come out well, um, and, and also the, the, the gold. It, 
you, you can see more of it, um, more of the features of it, I should say. But yes, it, it works well. Hmm. Okay. So, yeah, I think the gold certainly has more impact. I'm not sure if you've sharpened the eyes as well, um, but the, the whole image just really is much more striking, Emma. So wh what did you actually do? Anything above and beyond the basic edits? Um, no, I just did the basics, really, so that was it. Okay. Well, certainly given it more pop, hasn't, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you do anything with the eyes? Um, I think I just sharpened them a little bit, but that yeah. was it, not major. And, and that's all it needs because, you know, if this was originally a raw file, obviously, you know, you need to do that little bit of sharpening to um, just enhance the, the final output. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's always worth looking at the part of the image that really pulls the viewer in. And, you know, as with people and animals, it's always the eyes that you have to be looking at. So, well done. I like that. Thanks. It may, <coughs> excuse me, it may also work well in portrait format, you know, with having that sort of central um, subject matter. I don't know whether you have another version which would make it more about the goat because, you know, we're sort of seeing uh, the goat is central in the picture space. So it, it may work well, you know, just with uh, a portrait crop. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't crop it. I just kind of couldn't be bothered to do that, so I just left it. <laughs> so we're thinking about, though, just to give it a little bit more impact again. Yeah, it's a good suggestion. Um, next up we have Anne. Um, could I ask Heather to critique, please? Um, yeah, you can see that it has improved um, significantly. The, the sea looks lovely in sort of turquoisey blue. Um, it doesn't look overdone. It does look a little bit sharper, definitely. You can see a bit more definition with the, um, with the green on the, on the cliff tops. So yeah, it's definitely definitely improved the picture quite a lot. Yeah. Thank you, Heather. Um, did you use any dehaze on this, Sam? Um, no, because I don't know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I just more or less stuck to you know as I always do really uh, what was in the sort of handout. Okay. So um, we have used dehaze a little bit in the past um, on the last course, you know, when we had a horse in the field um, and that was just Lightroom CC, Lightroom, the web-based version. And um, you might remember... Oh, I, I, I can't remember a horse in the field at all. I, I, that's slipped my memory. I don't remember that. Oh, OK. Well, we'll look at it again. I've made a note just to yeah. cover dehaze because it's another one of those sliders that's quite powerful, a little bit like mm -hmm. clarity, but it can just lift the haze. So it can introduce haze if you go the other way, negative, or mm -hmm. it can just lift the haze. Um, so that, mm -hmm. that's just something that we will cover. It's so that would work with this, with this picture? And yeah, there's no harm in giving it a try. I mean, you can ap apply dehaze as a filter um, or you can just apply it as part of your digital workflow. Because sometimes, you know, if you take like a coastal scene, there's often, um, it can often be a little bit hazy and mm -hmm. that can just cut through. So you don't need to go high. You can keep the settings low. So it's just mm -hmm. something that uh, might be worth a look at. Mm, right. But yeah. anything to say about what you've done so far? On this image? Yeah. Um, no, as I say, I just sort of stuck to pretty much what was on the handout. But I did think it sort of brightened the whole thing up and you can see more in the sky. So I was pleased on the whole with that. I never mm. thought about DH, so I might revisit that and see what that would achieve. Well, if you do, then just upload your dehazed one as well, just so we can uh -huh. we can have a look at that. Yeah. And then just let yeah. me know if you've done it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think that's really good. I think the details are much more apparent. And we've got this sort of little house here as well that stands mm. out better. Colours are mm -hmm. more vibrant. So, yeah, good job and much better in the sky. 
Um, next up we have Lindsay. Um, could I ask Anne to critique, please? Just switch my microphone off as well. Um, yeah, I presume these are the other way around. Um, yes. The, the, yeah. Um, well, obviously, it's much it's much brighter. It really pops out better and is therefore a much more powerful image. And I like the, the it's it's very close into the snail. Um, and I like the way his feelers is that what they're called on the top of his head? A sort of I like the strong lines with the blades of grass and then his feelers um and all in all it's a it's a massive improvement i think really mm. yeah great uh, processing here lindsay thank you Anne. anything to say um no the, the only thing that i did do that's maybe a little bit different was i took out a lot of the green and the yellow from it because when i processed the snail um the green just looked completely unnatural so mm. that's the only thing that maybe i did over and above um in terms of processing. But again, you know, at the end of the day, it, is that the version that you sort of envisaged when you were working on it, coming out something like that or not? Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was. I mean, really, from, from my perspective, I was concentrating on the side of the snail, trying to bring out the, the detail and the colour in it. Yeah. Which and I you, think processing does. Yeah, you've definitely succeeded there. It just looks, you know, so much more vibrant and more striking um, than it did, obviously, out of camera. So, excellent work. Well done. A very low viewpoint. Were you down on your hands and knees yeah, for that yeah, one? I was equal with the snail. <laughs> a worthy subject. Um, so, James, you had a, a look at the fox. Um, did you find that was okay or any problems with that? Yes, no, no, I found it was okay. Um, was as I told you I've been ill, that's why I haven't done one of yeah. the It's the one I did just after we'd done it last week. But no, I didn't have any problems, it seemed to work fine. Okay, that's good, you made a good job of it. Well done. Um, Margie, are you here now? Yes, I'm here yeah, now. Yes, you are. Okay. Um, <laughs> Emma, can you critique this one, please? Um, it's definitely brought the colours out a bit more um, with the blue in the water um, and there's a, more contrast between the birds and the rocks as well which is nice and there's definitely more detail in the rock around the edges with the kind of greeny browny colour um, and it's, it's a better a better shot, better photo especially with the crop as well makes more of an impact yeah, yeah, I agree. And um, thank you for that, Emma. Anything to say about that one, Margie? Uh, yeah, the first picture I thought was absolutely terrible before I uh, lightened it up a bit. And I, I did it slightly more than just lighten it up. I, um, I put it through camera roll as well. Yeah. Let the colours come out, and then all of a sudden the birds, just all them colours and textures came out on the birds. I was quite pleased with it. Mm, yeah. Are they starlings, Margie? Yes. Yeah, and. yeah. It's incredible the actual detail that you can pull out of a starling's feathers oh. and the colours and everything. So they're very worthy subjects to photograph um, if you like bird photography. Okay. The only the only thing I would say, Margie, is it it is kind of a little bit overcooked on the blues. Yes. Yeah. And, um, you yeah. know, the, I would have maybe just pulled that back a little bit. The birds, you know, are certainly much enhanced. But, I mean, it obviously depends on your original intention. But I'll just say this area here just looks a little bit unnatural. It does, yeah. That, I, I thought that too. I, I really did. And I, just, I never thought they would, like, bring the colours back a bit more. Yeah. Um, but I soon will. I will. Okay. A much improved image overall. Well done. Um, next up, we we'll have Jonathan. Margie, could you critique, please? Yes. Uh, well, it's definitely improved. Um, is it the same picture, though? Because well, it, one's really large, one's really small. But yes, the, same, same picture. Yeah. Right. Well, you brought out lots and lots of detail on the puffin's wings and the sand eels. Um, overall, it's definitely a brighter, brighter picture. I think it's fabulous. I think you did an absolute great job. You can see every detail. 
the, his eyes, his beak, the fish, the wings, everything. It's, it's great. Thank you, Margie. <laughs> and anything to say, Jonathan? Uh, no, I was reasonably pleased with it. The, the sun deals aren't quite as sharp as what they could be. Um, but just sort of following the what you suggested, uh, it just brings out a lot more detail and it's uh, you're sharpening it. So there's a reasonable amount of detail. It's, it's clear. Yeah. I mean, it, it is quite difficult when you're starting off, you know, even when you have got a high resolution camera, but you're starting off with such a small subject in, you know, that huge expanse of blue. And we all know how difficult it is to get a puff and close enough um, that you can actually get a decent shot of. Um, so quite often you end up with these sort of little um, dots in the distance and then you're bringing them up. But uh, we can certainly appreciate all that detail that's there, even, you know, in such a, a huge expanse of blue. So it's always a case of like looking at different ways of capturing puffins. You know, sometimes from a boat, you can actually get a better shot um, than you can on land. And so, you know, next time round when we're going to the Farne Islands, it's in another way of uh, taking pictures of them, just trying to, to get them from, from the boat, um, you know, when they're out at sea fishing. So good job there, Jonathan. Well done. Thank you. Um, next up we have Graham. Um, could I ask Jonathan to critique please? Um, the final version is the one on the on the right? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's brought out a little bit, a lot more of the colour. In some ways, it's harder to look at. I think it's it's maybe slightly overdone on the on the brightness. Um, we're losing a bit of the softness of the hyacinth. Um, it is a hyacinth, is it? No, it's not. Whatever it is, um, the greens are much better. There is more detail there, but I think the flower. I'm not sure if there's too much contrast for me. There's something slightly missing. I, I don't know, can't put my finger on it. Okay, thank you for that, Jonathan. Anything to say, Graham? Do you feel that the image is a little overcooked or were you quite happy with um, the results? Yeah, I guess I was quite happy. I mean, I think, uh, I know what Jonathan's saying, uh, it's a sort of quite pinky. I, I wanted to bring out a little bit more detail. Maybe I, I should have pulled the the pink back a little bit. Um, I try to pull back the blue. You probably see at the back. It's sort of mm. gone. Try to make a little bit grey, so the blue didn't sort of distract as much. But yeah. maybe, yeah, maybe I did go a bit over the top of the pink. <laughs> but uh, I was sort of quite happy with the output. So. And that, that's the main thing. It's just that you know, if you see wanting to print, it's something to be aware of. You know, if the colours are mm. too vibrant, it's going to you know be emphasised more in the print as well. Um, and so that's why sometimes, you know, if you are thinking of printing something, people get like a lot of versions of a single print. We talked about different copies when we're editing, but it can be said the same thing with printing until you sort of get the print that you're happy with. So it's just something to be aware of and to, you know, kind of look closely and think, am I just going a little bit too far with colour here? Um, so yeah, just something to be aware of. Was this one of your images, Graham, or a yes, one? Yes, yes, it was. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's uh, that one was. Are they high sense? Uh, yeah, I think they were, it was when we were at Belsey. All right. Okay. It was, uh, yeah. Spring flowers. Yeah. yeah Lovely. That's right. Okay. Well done. Right. So that's the end of the slideshow. I hope I've shown everything that. Uh, everybody expected to see. So we'll just jump in now um, and have a look at Lightroom. So um, I'm just going to kind of demo the first part of this 
and then you can have a go then we'll demo the second part just so it's you, you don't actually have to download all of the handouts I mean you might have done already uh, for this but if not it just makes it a little bit easier so what we're going to be looking at um, as I mentioned before are snapshots and virtual copies um, so Lindsay what do you understand by a virtual copy I honestly don't know, but I assume it's I assume it's um, something to do with a copy that's just you know not not a full copy as it were you know a, a sort of a light copy if that's a way of putting it. But I honestly don't know. Okay, so just to explain basically what it is, so. If you say wanted to have like different versions of an image, any image at all, you can create a virtual copy. So to do that, if you just simply right click on your image and then you just choose create virtual copy. Okay, so then, then what happens is another image appears in your film strip and it's got a little curl to show that, as if it's curled up. That's just showing that that image is a virtual copy. So it can work really well. Um, so, for example, we've got this virtual copy and we can just have a look at various presets and then scroll through something that just looks like a little bit different. So if we go for desaturated content, then we've got that look. And then we can bounce between the two and just see which we prefer, the original or the virtual copy. Okay, So if you haven't got a lot of images, then it can work really well. But it can get really messy if, for example, you've been out on a busy photo shoot and you come back with 500 images and you've got a whole lot of these virtual copies it can just sort of get a little bit out of hand because obviously you've got like potentially another 500 images in the film strip, okay? Um, so the thing is to remember though, it doesn't actually take up any extra space on your hard drive. The edits that you make are written to the Lightroom catalogue um, and so that is another advantage of doing it that way. So I'll just pause there while you have a look at that within your own Lightroom, just the right click and the create virtual copy. The other thing to remember is the copy will be recognized in Photoshop. You just simply right click on the image and then you can choose edit in Photoshop. Once that comes up. And you can just edit it as a normal image. And is it equivalent to full raw file then, if you take it into Photoshop? Is yes, it, it is. So you can just process it as normal, you can output it, you can do everything because Photoshop recognises what's actually been done to it. So the virtual copy, the edits are written to the Lightroom catalogue, but you've got this transfer between Lightroom and Photoshop and this recognition of what you're actually working with. So yes, you can export it as normal. Okay, have we had a chance to look at that or am I going too fast? So I've um, created a copy of one of my images and then I, I went into that presets bit but when I'm clicking on them it's not changing it at all. Right, are you in the develop module? Yes. Yeah, um, and so you you can see the image that you're working on, so that yeah. could be a virtual copy, and then yeah. you just, it isn't seeing something like image not found or anything like that, is it? No. No, and then you basically, some of them look very similar. So as I scroll down through these presets, um, so I'm in creative, you can see some of them are very similar. So maybe just keep scrolling down the list because you should see it changing. Oh, I'll tell you what I think I did. I think I, think I didn't click on the, the triangle. So they're, they're like subsets, aren't they? 
Yes, but you, you just have to click on the image itself in the film strip. So maybe just click on the original, then click back on the virtual copy, and then just try going through again. Can you see it changing as you just scroll through them? I can see. Yes, I yes. can. Okay. I seem to have lost the virtual copy now. I think I need a new pair of glasses, to be honest. This film strip at the bottom is... Um... Yeah, I've lost my virtual copy now. Is that okay? I have to say, I can't get mine to change either. So right. I can't even see them. Okay, so... If you just click out of your virtual copy and go to your original and then just scroll through and you're just hovering so you're not clicking to you say that you want a certain style so you're just scrolling through and then you should see a change in the main workspace on your original first yes and then go once you see your original change go back to your virtual copy Click on that in the film strip and then scroll through and see if that's changing. Or change it, you know, you don't have to look at creative, maybe go black and white so it looks very different. Has anybody else got a problem with this or is it mainly working now? Jane, how would you say you differentiate between the original and the virtual copy? So the virtual copy has what looks just like a turn back corner at the base. So um, you might be able to see the one I'm pointing at. Um, at the bottom left hand corner, there's just like, you just think the paper was curled oh. back. Oh. So that's, right. that's how I know that's my virtual copy. Right. Dear me, it's quite subtle. Right, thank you. <clears throat> uh, anybody else having a problem with this, or is it okay? So, if I'm not hearing anything, I assume everything's fine. <laughs> okay. Are we ready to look at the next method? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the first one is really good if you haven't got tons of images because you can see at a glance on your film strip um, where you've got the virtual copies and you can have as many as you like of one image but just bearing in mind that it's going to take up space. So the other method is we could select an image and we can use the preset make it look a little bit different etc so scroll through see all of the different presets and um, so i might just put something on that one there and then i'm going to snapshot okay and then within snapshot you just click on the little plus um, and then you can type in what it is you've done so you're aware of that Bearing in mind, this could be multiple edits, okay? So it could be a preset or it could be edits you've applied. It doesn't have to be a preset. So um, just for the sake of seeing a difference, um, I've chosen a um, heavy vignette. Okay. Then I click create. Now in presets, I've got heavy vignette, okay? So um, I could explore that further and maybe, you know, go down the vignette route and choose one with none or could just, just choose something, again, that looks a little bit different. So I might choose something like warm shadows, okay? So that's another one. I can apply that and click on my plus and then choose warm shadows and create that. So you can see how this is sort of building up um, and then it's not as messy because also you haven't got like a whole lot of different copies in your film strip. So you can just go to the snapshots and you can see, okay, that was heavy vignette, that's warm shadows, 
and you could have like multiple edits as I say it doesn't have to just be a preset then once you've got that done um, it gets a little bit more complicated but again it's this integration so you can right click on the image choose edit in but then this time instead of just edit in Photoshop we open it as a smart object in Photoshop. James, can you remember anything about smart objects or anything that uh, you think is particularly good about them? Um, I'm afraid not a bit more. <laughs> okay, I shouldn't have picked on you because I've forgotten that you're not well. I'll go to Graham instead. You sound very perky this evening, Graham. So what can you tell me about smart <laughs> oh, objects? <laughs> I think, if I remember rightly, with a smart object, it was non-destructive, the changes you made, you could go back, couldn't you? Yes, that's right. It's non-destructive, um, and you can create a link. So when you apply filters or anything to a smart object, you can revisit that point. So if I was to, say, put a Gaussian blur on here, on this image, after I've created a smart object... I can decide, ah, I need more blur so I can go back into it. So it's non-destructive. It's the way Adobe really want you to work. So anyway, to continue, I'm going to say open as smart object in Photoshop. Now I just click on my Photoshop and then just wait. So it's opened as a smart object. We can see because we've got that little stamp in the corner that it's opened as a smart object. If I double click on it now, it's going to take me into Adobe Camera Raw. Okay, so within Camera Raw, you can apply all of the raw edits that you may wish to work with, um, any changes that you may wish to make. Um, and then this, it can take a little bit of time to update, but you can take a look at snapshots within Adobe Camera Raw, okay? Well, it's actually updated pretty quickly. So it's updated with the snapshots that I've actually applied in Lightroom. So I've got heavy vignette and warm shadows. And so you've got both of those. And again, you can take the edits further. So if I was thinking, oh yeah, warm shadows, that's going to be really good, then I can take that as my starting point. So you can see how this can be incorporated into your digital workflow from Lightroom, just that right click and then open as a smart object in Photoshop and then you've got this, this way of working between the two. So that's the next thing to have a look at. Have we got any notes on this at all, Jane? Yes. Um, I hope I've uploaded them, actually. So, I should. Let me just quickly see. No, I haven't uploaded them yet. Sorry, I thought I had. Um, I'll just make a note to upload. Because, yes, I have done notes on this. So, I will upload the notes on it. Because you couldn't possibly remember all of this. <coughs> It started out as a quick task. <laughs> I thought it would just take like two minutes, but then I thought, well, we can't really do it properly unless we sort of see the workload through um, and then this way of working in Photoshop and then uh, being able to go from Photoshop into Adobe Camera Raw. So I'll, I'll upload it at the end of the session, okay? Do you need me to go back through it, or have you got it? I, d I don't think I've got it, Jane, because I've selected an image and clicked on snapshots, and then it's just asking me for a name, but... Yes, 
So you select your image and then yeah. you can just go through and make any changes that you want to do. And then you would make those changes and then you just click on the plus sign and then you would name it so it's something relevant. Um, so if you've applied, um, say, desaturation, uh, yeah. yeah. So I think I, yes, I think what I've done was I tried to create a shop, snapshot before I did anything to it. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, right. And just have a, a little look to see what you want to, to call yeah. it, yeah. Jane, once you've like applied something and created the snapshot, so I've just created a snapshot now and I've got the um, effect on there. Yes. How do I then revert back to the original to then apply a different effect and create you, a second you just You just go from that point. So that is your first snapshot. And then you would have that snapshot open and then you would just say go from, supposing it's desaturated content and then you want to go to cool tones, you just choose another one or do some ah. different edits and then save that as the next snapshot. Ah, right, okay, thank you. So don't forget this um, session's being recorded. Uh, so once it's processed and uh, uploaded to YouTube, if you want to watch it over, and um, if you haven't quite got the uh, snapshots and the virtual copy um, techniques, then you can always watch them again. Is that working okay for everybody? Yeah. Yeah. It is for me. Is it something yes, that thanks to me. Oh good. Is it something that you would use or do you think it's just easier to right click and do a virtual copy? I think I, I think I possibly would use snapshots. I do like the the way it's as you see, you're not creating loads of images in your film strip, it's sort of more self contained. And I do like as you see when you go across into Photoshop when you open the camera raw, you can go back and, and access the individual snapshots as well. Yeah. And and make changes. You know, so if it's like a big project you're working on, you can sort of see how something looks and if it's not right, um, you don't have to start over. You can just say double click on the, the Gaussian blur, for example, add a bit more blur. And um, so it's, it's like a smarter way of working, I would say. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are we ready to move on or would, do we need a few more minutes? I just asked something, Jane. Of course, he can. Know, stupid, no, 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 no. <laughs> I like this as well because it doesn't take up as much in the film strip. But it, when then, when you go into library, how do you find your original image? Because I did that, and it seems to be this latest snapshot that's appeared. Yeah, because don't forget that it'll show you something in library, but you can always, when you take your image into develop, you've always got your history, okay? So that history is constant. It's not, you know, like Photoshop where it disappears. So I've got this picture. Oh, yeah, so right, if yeah. I decide, actually, I want to go back to where I started from before I started changing everything, I can go back to import. Yes, I've, I've got that. I've seen that now, yeah. yeah. So they're all there in the library. Yes. Then, 
Yes. Yeah. So you've got your history there, and you can just go back and, and make changes. Oh, sure. and develop under history. Yeah, yeah, I can see that now. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Well, that's it. Yeah. Also toggling, sorry, toggling between them as well and comparing, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Jane, where do you find the snapshots in Camera Raw? Um, so the, there's an icon um, that just looks like, uh, just one second, I'll just create something here. I'm just going back one second. I just deleted everything, so I just have to redo it. So I'm just going to open my original image back into Photoshop as a smart object. Okay, that's it there. So then I'm double clicking on my thumbnail. And then the icon just looks like several oh, okay. boxes and the shortcut is Shift and S. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and then you, you see... What do you think, Jonathan? Is this something you would use or not? Uh, I think I might. Uh, I've not. I've not used it. I've not really used presets either. So uh, it'll take a little bit of experimenting with, but I think it's easy enough to follow, and it certainly gives you options uh, as to what you want to do. I think if you're doing creative stuff, it would be very useful. Think yeah. If you're processing just wildlife or landscapes and things, I'm not sure. Maybe for the lighting and landscapes, yes. Hmm. I'll make a try. Yeah, but don't forget, it, it's like not just presets that you know you could have like a whole lot of edits that you've done um, in one snapshot and then and in another snapshot, say the black and white version with a whole lot of edits. So, um, you know, snapshots can be a starting point or you can just not use them. It can just be edits as well and to take that snapshot, which is um, really quite useful. Are we ready to move on or are we needing a little bit longer? It's okay. It's okay? Yeah. Everyone saying okay? Yes. Okay. Right, so with this image, we should have just actually... We're just going to, again, say this was a requested topic. Let's pop that in a little bit. So we're going to take effect. Okay, so... What we're starting out with here, um, we've got just our regular image of a lion and we've got our image of some leaves which we'd rather use as background for the lion. So quite often if you see, um, generally in a zoo, you may see you know, really nice photo opportunity to capture a picture of an animal but then sometimes it might have like concrete behind it or just something that you really don't want and so this technique is just a little bit of practice at selecting in order to enhance the image by putting in a more natural background but you're doing it in a smart way so you're thinking you know that it needs to have the right lighting and um, the right tonal qualities and also pulling back some of the definition so that it's not too sharp as well so that gives the animal a chance to stand out so we're starting off with the lion if we press the w key on the keyboard then that immediately brings up the selection tool okay and um, so as you can see it could be one of three so it's not always the quick selection tool that comes up first because they've all got that W as the shortcut once we've got a selection tool though I mean if you want to use a quick selection obviously you look for its icon you can go to select subject and then get Photoshop to do a little bit of the hard work for you. So you can see it hasn't really done such a bad job. 
it's made like a pretty good outline and hasn't quite got the whiskers in though and so this is where we have to go into select and mask in order to refine the selection. So once we're in select and mask we can view what we're working with on overlay. So in the view panel we have a whole range of different options how we can view the selection. Um, it's often good to use overlay. I use this probably 70% of the time, um, but you can also alternate between overlay and marching ants just to see how accurate your selection is. So overlay, if you haven't got selected, the shortcut is V. So once you've got that selected, you can take down the opacity of overlay until you can sort of see exactly what's been included and what's been missed out. So that's the point where you can just sort of make a few changes. Um, so the way that the software is going to look for the edge when I use Refine Edge, I'm telling it to I'm keeping a, a low radius just to include the bits that I want to include. So I'm just taking it up to four pixels. And then I'm going to the toolbox on the left and then picking up the Refine Edge brush tool. And then basically what we're doing is just going around um, and again you can use your right square bracket if you just need to increase the size of your brush. And then you let the tool catch up and then just try and include some of the, the parts of the selection that haven't actually been included. So we basically go around and then you give the tool a chance to catch up. So what we're doing is just adding to the selection area. just let it catch up and then go back. So I would spend quite a lot of time on this normally, but for the purposes of demonstration, I'll not do so, just so that you guys can get on and have a go yourselves. And um, so to improve the selection further, selection's a little bit jagged, we can use the smooth slider, which basically smooths out some of the jagged edges. So um, anything around about 15 to 20 for smooth can work well. And I'm also going to feather the selection just to get a softer edge. Now sometimes you have to repeat this process. So when you complete the selection, then you come out and then sometimes you've got to go back into select and mask just to refine it a little bit further. So if I just go back and have a look on my, at my marching ants, I can see there's parts of the whiskers haven't been included. So I just go back into overlay and then again with my brush tool. And sometimes you've got to be quite patient with this because it doesn't always work as well. I'm just going to add those in. As I say, I'd normally spend quite a bit of time on this just to get it more accurate. Then we come down to how we want the selection to be output. And then we're just going to output to selection and click OK and see how it looks. So it could be a little bit better. We've still missed the whiskers. So and go back into select and mask to try and tidy that up a little bit more. And then if we just have a little look here, we still output a selection. Sometimes decontaminate colours can help as well. And then let's have another little look higher up. See how it's picking up those. It still hasn't got the whiskers. So just go back to the overlay and try once again. A little bit down these 
these edges. I'll keep on with this until I get a better selection. I will let you guys have a go and then click OK. And then you see it's given me a new layer with layer mask because I went into decontaminate colours. So now you can spend a little bit of time refining the selection if needs be on the layer mask. So I'll just pause there so that you guys can have a go as well at just getting a decent selection of the lion before we introduce it into the leaves background. So Jane, with, with this one, the line, we're not pulling it into Lightroom at all, we're just taking no, it straight No, we're just going, yeah, we're just going to open this one straight into Photoshop and uh, then we'll do the next thing. Okay. So you see, this is the one that I did earlier and persevering with your selection, you will get it to eventually pick up those whiskers and so that you can get a good selection. It just doesn't always happen straight off the bat. <laughs> Now, sometimes if you look carefully, you'll see that you've actually got the whiskers selected, um, but they don't show up that well against the transparent background. So if you zoom in, you'll see, and once we take the lion into the leaves, obviously you'll see them stand out if you've managed to get them selected as well. So just let me know when you've got your lion selected and you're ready to do the next bit where we move them into the leaves. When I'm in uh, Photoshop, I keep losing my layers panel. I'm not sure why. Right. Um, if you press the F7 key, that will bring it back. That's the shortcut. Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. Sometimes you can have, say, properties open over layers, and so it can be behind the properties panel. Uh, but if it's, you know, if you press F7, you can see where it is.
gin. Nothing's happening when I'm pressing the W on the keyboard. Right. Um, so W is the, the actual shortcut. So you should just see uh, the selection tool light up. Can you see that on the toolbox? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's all that happens. So it just means, you see, if I've got a brush tool selected, I don't know if you can see my screen, but I've just as comparison, I've got a brush tool yeah. selected. I don't have select and mask or select subject. But if I press W, that means with the selection tool selected, I've got select subject and select and mask. All right. Yes, thank you. Oh, I just mentioned before, anybody that's interested, um, I have a few places left for a small mammal workshop with Andy Howie, um, and that's going to be Saturday, the 6th of November, and that's at his new studio, which is at Lawick, just near Haggerston. Um, so quite an interesting workshop, good experience for working under studio conditions. Uh, working with animals. I know some of you have been before. Um, it's half the price you'd pay if you went through a magazine. So um, I'm charging £70 for the workshop. If you're interested, and it's a full day, it's from 10 normally till half past three, four o'clock. Um, if you're interested, just let me know, then I can add your name to the list. Jane, when I'm trying to um, use the refine edge brush, I've set all the sliders at the things you've said, and then when I try to do anything with it, absolutely nothing is happening. I get a, a square, a, a circle with a little plus sign in. Yeah, so that's basically what you're doing. Let me just... Uh... When, when you did it, there was like a black line appeared. Yeah. No, there's when no black line appearing. You, you're actually setting all of those things, like the smooths and everything, after you've finished. Oh, after you've finished? Yeah, so you've got your selection and then it's a little bit jagged, so then you smooth it. You know, yeah, I can't seem to, I mean, I've just followed the sheet through and it, it, I can't seem to, I mean, I don't know whether it's just that this computer's running slow or... Right, I'll just show, I don't you, know. show you my one again. So, um, <clears throat> again, I'll just quickly do a select subject on another lion and then go into select and mask. And uh, right, so we'll just go through um everything. So you're looking at it on the overlay. Mm -hmm. You can see that sort of ready background, and you've taken your opacity down. Then mm -hmm. don't do any make any other changes. So right. just leave smooth and feather and all those things at zero. But just take the radius up to about four. Uh huh. And then in the toolbox, you get the refine edge brush tool and it's on plus, uh -huh. yeah, and then just paint like a little bit and then stop. And then it, it should catch up with what you're doing. And then just have a look at the marching ants so you can see how the selection is actually coming along. So it's picking up pretty well there. Don't forget. Yeah, mine uh, had refined hair and I just picked on it and it picked up all the whiskers and everything. Yeah, I mean, refined hair can do a great job. That's another thing that you can use as well. So if you find that works better, then pop them to Marching Ants and it's actually got the whiskers first time.
that's maybe a little bit easier because it's it looks as if it's pretty good it hasn't got everything like round the edges so you may want to do a bit refined edge to get some of the fuzzy bits but um, it's surprising actually how good that refined hair is I think I think I've got some problem with Photoshop. I think that's what the problem is because it's not very happy. <laughs> so I think that's what my problem is. Oh, okay. So what makes you think it's not happy? It's just not able. It's not up up to speed, or it's not up to speed. And then I'm trying to maximize and minimize the screen and things, and it's not having it at all. So. Have you got, no. like, a lot of other things open? Uh, it could be that my husband has, um, because he, he works. No, not, not huge amounts of things, actually. I've got all the things we need for tonight, really. Um, but I think that's what the problem is. It's, make, it's making that sort of tone, do do, you know. Yeah. Um, you haven't awesome. got... Like another box open, a dialogue box open somewhere that it's just kind of making that noise because ah, um, it's maybe slipped like out of sight. It could be like further down the way. Um, that might have been it. Yeah. Yeah, I forget about that. Yeah, it's happier now, so that was what it was, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, are we ready to put the leaves in yet, or are we still with on with the selection? Well, I still can't get it to do it, but I think I think we should move on, and then we can sort of I can look at it afterwards at you know my own okay. time. Okay. Otherwise, we'll run out of time, won't we? I'll just see if everybody else is ready to do the next bit. Yeah, ready to go. Okay, so yeah. once we're back in Photoshop, we've chosen Output to Selection. If we press Command or Control and G, that'll cut the lion to its own layer. So the lion's now on a transparent background. It's been cut out from where it was originally. So that's Command or Control and G. Once you've got a selection, then that'll cut the lion, in this case, to a new layer. We then select the Move tool. So that's V on your keyboard. And then when you've got your move tool selected, you just simply make sure you're on your lion layer and then you click and drag your lion into leaves. Um, there's obviously discrepancy in size, so we use Command and T and then just pull up from a corner handle. And then you, just so you can fit everything on screen, it's sometimes a good idea just to zoom out a little bit. And then you can just get the lion the right size for his new surroundings. Um, obviously, we're going to just need to do a little bit of a crop here. So you can select your crop tool and then just crop in to where the, the boundary is right here and then we're selecting our leaves layer so after you've done the resizing you just select the leaves layer and we're going to work on that so right click on that layer and then convert it to a smart object and then we can just do some exclusive edits on the smart object so we can go to filter and blur and Gaussian blur so we can just blur the leaves in order to make them look a bit better so we're seeing an image in the inspection window of just how the blur is going to look so you may want more than six pixels so if we take it down to six we can see that's quite a bit of blur but it's best not to go too crazy, not too much blur, because obviously the line looks quite close to the background 
and so to get that um, degree of blur, if it was a severe blur, there would be more distance. So you have to still just think about that. So you can try, see a blur of, say, 6 pixels to 10 pixels. And then if you want to, you can always go back because we've created the smart filter, uh, which is a byproduct of the smart object. Everything's got to be smart, of course. So it goes in, goes in blur. We just double click on that on the word, word goes in blur. And then we can go back and we can add a little bit more blur. And then if you've gone too far, which I have here, just pull it back and then click OK. So at this stage, we've got the blur completed. And then we can just click on our top layer. And then working on the top layer, we can create, um, it's either known as a stamp layer or a composite layer by pressing Shift, Command, Control and E. Just bring that back up a second. Sorry, that was Shift, Command, Alt and E or Shift, Control, Alt and E. And that creates a combination of everything you've done so far. And we can also create a smart object out of that layer. So again, the right click and then just go down to Create Smart Object. So we've created a smart object and we can go into Camera Raw. So filter and camera raw filter. And then working as a whole, we can apply any additional edits working with base, the basic panel that you might feel are necessary. So it might not be this image you're working with. It could be a different one. We'll just zoom out of that slightly. And then to finish off with, we can apply a nice vignette. So if we go to the effects tab and vignetting, then we can just create a nice little darkening. Nothing to look too extreme. So it just draws attention to the subject with a little bit of darkening of the edges. After we finish that, we just click OK. And that brings us back again into Photoshop. So that was the one we did a little bit earlier. Put that one there. And so that's the next thing to look at, where you're working with the background in order to soften it and just to add a little bit of glue.